guess my main goal is so you have all the tools in place to uh, to get lab two and it's due the Monday after reading week. So um, I'm sure you can find some folks who've taken the course in the past, Emily and at SCAS, they'll, they'll help you get it done um, if you're not done already. But, uh, and I guess I've heard from a couple of folks who want to, if they did less than perfect, <laughs> on uh i finally got lab one marked at, obviously and um so a couple of folks are going to resubmit question or two um which is as i said before that's totally fine um i think i think mainly doing it just to kind of get it right as opposed to being no there's no deadline <laughs> it's okay <laughs> whenever you get time <laughs> um up to and including the day i have to submit the final marks yeah, it's kind of like, a, um, I think I've mentioned the BC uh, climate change uh, project I worked on last year. And um, that was actually a record for me. You, you folks probably move much quicker than this, but Trevor Reynoldson and I got the contract to do this in, well, about a year ago, exactly, in February. Um, the initial report was due, we did it for BC MOE, Ministry of the Environment, and the initial report was due, I think, by the end of the fiscal. So we had like two months to do a fairly major, major analysis, but we got something done that was pretty good. But um, we sort of agreed in advance to um, do like a revision, revised version where we took a bit more time so i think that we got that done by by may but then miraculously i i did a presentation on it at uh, the european freshwater meeting uh, last june and uh published it in this paper uh i think november and that's like a world record for me from you know, kind of starting the project to publishing it, um, and, and you know, it wasn't a, it wasn't one of those predatory journals. I didn't pay to get it published or anything, so I was pretty happy about that. Okay, well, let's let's get started. Well, the tape is rolling, so um, yeah, today the lecture part is really just to talk about assumptions um that is the assumptions behind and we talked a little bit about this when i first uh, gave out lab two or talked to a lab two um, because it's built into the uh, scripts that i have there the assumptions behind using linear models like t-test regression and all that, that sort of thing so we'll talk about that for a few minutes and then I'll talk about power. You know, we talked a fair bit about alpha, you know, the chance of a type one error when you're doing hypothesis testing. And we'll talk more about, or as much about beta today. Um, power, and that has to do, it can help you do two things. One is plan a study. If you're wondering kind of what sample size you need, it's the age old question. I've been asked it thousands of times over my career as kind of somebody knows a bit about stats. But also, I mean, most of us, including me, um, it's not like you decide what your sample size is going to be. You kind of have it thrust upon you, right? If for no other reason, if you're doing an observational study, there's only so many places there that are kind of pertinent to your study or you only have so much in the way of resources whether that's time money you know people people to help out and such so um power is useful in most cases as kind of a, a retrospective way to judge what your ability was to detect some deviation from the null hypothesis. 
So we'll talk about both those things and then I'll have a bit of a break, grab a cup of tea, and then just we'll get into lab two and the parts of it that pertain to assumptions and power so that everybody knows how to, how to get lab two done. Okay. So let me go into presentation mode with the these slides, which is why I wanted to use two devices here. There we go. And we'll talk about assumptions. So there's kind of, and as always, I I lean much more towards the practical than the theoretical in this. Um, so really uh, interested in you know all, all the judgments I make about uh, adherence to assumptions by my data are made by examining plots and looking at different aspects, different diagnose, diagnostics that help me decide whether or not my data are close to adhering to assumptions. And the three biggies for sure are normal distribution of residuals, uh, something called homoscedasticity, 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 say that really fast. And then finally, linear relationships between the response and predictors. And that last one is really only relevant in the, in the sort of uh, general linear model, like a multiple regression context, but we'll, we'll get into all three of these a little bit. The, the first thing to realize though, um, and this used to be emphasized to me endlessly by my old PhD supervisor, Roger Green, um, if you've got a reasonably large sample size and, and a balanced design, linear models are robust. And what, what robust means is, because it's all about, it's all about the p-value, right? Remember, we use the p-value to judge whether or not we're going to reject the null hypothesis. And what this, what this statement is saying is, yeah, you can pretty much rely on that p-value, even if your assumptions are kind of not really holding. Um, if you've got a big enough sample size, enough data, and a balanced design. Balance just means, um, you know, if, if you're talking about a, yes, Omar, I, I sent that announcement to um, both both the directed studies and the grad stats course. So yeah, I'm, I'm just uh, on Zoom today. So for the confusion. Um, anyway, the balanced design means that the predictors are uncorrelated, whether they're categorical or quantitative. So it's like, remember when we were talking about categorical data analysis, you're not seeing particular combinations of two categorical predictors more often than others. They're, they're independent of each other. And in the case of quantitative predictors, there's no correlation or little correlation between the predictors. That's, that's what a balanced design means. Okay, so let's talk about normal distribution. Um, first thing, it, it's kind of table stakes for understanding the importance of the normal distribution. And it'll be super interesting when, when we have the presentations at the end of the term of papers that you've found to, to just look at, I'm sure we'll find uh, more than one that will talk about, well, the data weren't normally distributed, therefore I did this or that or the other thing. Um, but but remember, when we're talking about a normal distribution, the easiest way to kind of know what I'm talking about is with, uh, let's say, simple linear regression. Um, so we're not talking about the distribution. Is the distribution of the Y variable, the response variable, or sometimes called the dependent variable, normal or not? Or is the distribution of the X variable or predictor variable, independent variable, normal or not? We're not talking about that at all. We're talking about the distribution of points around that regression line, the scatter around the regression line. We'll look at that in detail in a couple of minutes. So 
it's that presumption that there's a normal distribution of residuals that kind of allows us to use the t-distribution to test hypotheses. It kind of, um, I guess, is, again, it's a requirement that those residuals be normally distributed if we're going to believe the p-values that we get from the uh, theoretical distribution, the t-distribution. So this is kind of, I mean, this is a graphic. We've seen a version of this before the, where the, we've got three groups here in an ANOVA situation. Um, we're comparing, I guess we're comparing their age. And so each group has a, has a distribution with the represented with that you know, little bell over it. And the residuals are the deviations between each individual in a given group and the mean of that group. So some of them have positive residuals, they're above the mean, some have negative residuals, they're below the mean. And if you gather up residuals from all three groups, that's your set of residuals. And you look at the distribution of that group of residuals as a whole to judge this assumption of normality. So all I'm showing here is that we've gone from these three groups where we've We've recorded the age of each individual within the three groups. And we have a residual for each individual, which is how different is their age from the mean of their group. And we could pile all of those residuals into one, one set of residuals, you know, individuals from all three groups, and look at whether or not their, their distribution is approximately normal. So the way we do that, and, and we did this once way back, but we'll do it again um, a little bit later in R, is that we can look at the a histogram of residuals. That's what you see on the left, where zero's in the middle, and you have so many residuals that are just a little bit less than the mean or, or just a little bit more than the mean, and, and it trails off. And you should see if, if this assumption is holding, you should see it, it's sort of a more or less symmetric distribution about zero. The other way that we do that, and that's produced, this diagnostics produced in the scripts that I've shared with you for doing everything from t-test to multiple regression, is you put this, what are called the standardized residuals on the y-axis, and the theoretical quantiles from the normal distribution on the x-axis, and we don't have to worry about the, the theory of this, we've got the actual residuals, you know, standardized. Again, don't have to worry about that. Just think of this as the residuals that we actually saw with the data on the y-axis, and the residuals that we expect if the their distribution is normal on the x-axis. So that dashed line that I'm hiding with the with the points is where we would expect those those points to fall if the distribution was perfectly normal. So this, the plot on the right matches the one we see on the left, right? The, the, the plot on the left, yeah, the, norm, the residuals look like they're pretty much normally distributed. The plot on the right matches that one. That's what we would see in this quantile, quantile um, plot if the data, if the residuals are normally distributed. So another situation that's probably gonna be much more common with your data sets, certainly is with mine, is that the residuals, you know, look at that histogram on the left. It, they're kind of wacky. Like there's, there's uh, more really close to the mean on the, on the negative side. And then you've got some extreme positive values, just a few extreme positive values on, on the plus side of zero. But suffice to say, that doesn't look like a very symmetric distribution. And that translates, I, I, this is like a cartoon, but I'm, what I'm trying to do here is this, the QQ plot on the right matches the kind of distribution you see on the right, on the left. <laughs> um, so we've got you know, 
a difference or a deviation from that that line, straight line there. And that's telling us that there's something other than a normal distribution of the residuals for this particular data set. So we have diagnostics like that, and I'll, I'll show them to you with real data um, when we look at the scripts in our. So homoscedasticity um, is, is really just similarity of variance. So variance in the response variable among observations is the same at all values of the predictor. And that's what allows us to combine residuals, what we just did, for example, when we were looking at the normal distribution. And that combination of residuals from all levels of the predictors is kind of what's underneath the statistical, statistical test we're doing. So it's super important, if I go back to that first plot I showed, you know, the three groups that were comparing their ages, it's super important that there's about the same width, you know, it's about the same amount of variability in all three groups. This last one, see how it's a little bit less, it's, it's narrower, so there's, that means less variability there. But what we're looking for is, you know, not too different in terms of variability. And that's the second, the second major uh, assumption of linear models. So uh, that's, it tends to get broken in many ways, that assumption of homoscedasticity or equality of variance. Here's one very common way with the sort of regression type data. This goes back to that um, that data set I was talking about last time, the Western, or time before last, the Western salaries, faculty salaries in relation to a bunch of different variables. This one, years since highest degree. But what you're seeing here is so-called trumpet effect, which is why I had the trumpet on the slide, um, is just look up and down at those vertical deviations. Those are the residuals for a simple linear regression. So the, dis the difference between this person's salary and what you'd expect given their year since highest degree. So they've got a positive residual. They're making more than you'd expect. This next person is just slightly below the line. They're making a little less than you'd expect. This person is making exactly what you'd expect. This person a little more, this person a little less. But what I'm trying to show in this is there's more variability up and down as you get to higher values of years since highest degree. So what the assumption of homoscedasticity is, is you've got about the same amount of scatter whether you're at this end of the line or that end of the line or halfway in between, that's the assumption. So there's ways that we we look at that. Uh, sorry, ways that we look at that. That I mean, one simple visual way to look at it that we'll see in the diagnostics in uh, our scripts is if everybody just tilts their head slightly sideways so that that line of best fit is horizontal. So if, I, if my head's tilted sideways, that's corresponding to zero residual, right? The points that are right on it, like, like this person here, have a residual value of zero. And then above, I'm seeing positive. Below, I'm seeing negative. Um, but the, that's going to be a, uh, a better visual, even though it's the same data, nothing's changed it tends to be a better visual way to see heteroscasticity. There's difference in variability depending on what value of predictors that you have. Okay, final one that really only comes into play uh, with uh, quantitative predictors is the linearity assumption. And you'll see why that is when we look at a couple of examples from the R scripts, but this is looking at the relationships between a quantitative predictor and a quantitative response variable. Again, like a, like a simple regression situation. And linear models, as the name implies, can only pick out linear relationships. So 
they can't sort of see what they're um, what they're not designed to to detect. So, what the way that we check out that linearity assumption, and this is just again with very simple example here with the, the one response variable and the one predictor. But we'll see in the more complicated situations in the R scripts is again by looking for patterns in the residuals so i put the uh the regression line on there the dot the dotted line is the line of best fit these this one response variable one predictor um and again if we all tilt our heads <laughs> um we can see that yeah that for the first for the lower values of years since highest degree the residuals tend to be below the line for the middle values, they tend to be above the line. And then for the upper values, they tend to be below the line. Now, keep in mind something really important here. We're not, we're not talking about the amount of scatter, because the amount of scatter might be about the same. And we're not talking about the normality, you know, are they normally distributed about that line? We're talking about patterns as you move along the line and so that pattern and seeing kind of tending to see more negatives here more positive residuals here and more negatives there is indicative of maybe there's not a linear relationship between these two and if you if you pull off that i think we can do this yeah you can see when I took away the regression line that yeah, actually it looks like we have a curvilinear relationship here. So that there's ways, and I don't want to see there's ways to get at that curvilinear relationship, even in the general linear model, but I'm just trying to make the point that seeing that pattern is telling us that at least for this simple linear regression, that assumption of a linear relationship between salary and years since highest degree doesn't look like it's met. Okay, so I'll, I'll just pause for a sec to see, because I see there's a chat there that I told people I'd be watching. Um, okay, it's just Omar asking me about in person. Okay, we're good. All right. So, if everybody's good with that, so just again, think of the three biggies as normality of residuals, almost cadasticity, and then for quantitative predictor models, and only them, and I'll explain why when we look at a couple of examples, we have the assumption of linearity, the linear relationship. Okay, what do we do when we're convinced that the assumption one or more of the assumptions are just not holding yeah. and again i i tend to go on the basis of a qualitative assessment of them there's all sorts of ways some of you will have used them of testing hypotheses about you know are the are the residuals normally distributed um, is the variance in this group bigger than the variance in this other group and linearity as well but i tend to as usual you can i think you know my biases uh, pretty well by now um really look carefully at diagnostics to see whether or not i think the assumptions uh, hold so what do you do if they if you're convinced they don't or they aren't holding for for your data well there's two ways there used to be three ways <laughs> That uh, people dealt with them, but there's really two main ways that people deal with uh, the data not adhering to assumptions these days. The first are transformations. You transform your response and or your predictor values so that not to kind of get the results that you wanted to get or thought you should get. That's a common kind of misconception about transformations, but really to get your data to better adhere to the assumptions of linear models. So that's one way, and, and we'll 
look at that in a sec. Second way is what I call homemade null distributions. And that's where um, you basically get a p-value. Remember a p-value, what that means. It's always about um, what was the chance of getting these data if the null was true. That's what it boils down to. It's not, what's the chance this result just happened by chance? You know, that's the common misstatement of, of what a p-value is. So um, it all comes down to that null hypothesis distribution. And the assumptions are all about whether or not you can use, usually it's t, sometimes uh, chi-square, sometimes an F distribution, but can you use those distributions to generate a p-value and therefore test your null hypothesis? And what's become very common in, in the last 10, 15 years is, well, I'm not sure the assumptions hold, so I'm just gonna create my own null distribution and then see what's the chance of getting these data at the null were true with my homemade null distribution. And one of your, in one of your, uh, uh, lab two questions, you actually use a little script that, that does a homemade null. Okay. So let's look at these. First off, um, you know, talking about transformations, you may have seen a couple in, in your work, but um, far and away the most common transformation and usually of response variables. Uh, to to kind of hopefully get the data closer adhering to the assumptions of linear models is the log transformation. So you're using the log of the response variable's value instead of the response variable's value itself in your t-test or regression or ANOVA or whatever. And, and you'll do that in lab two if you haven't done it already where you do the t-test or you do the ANOVA and then you do it not using the quantitative response variable itself but using the log of the quantitative response variable. And that often helps to um, put the data, you're putting the data on a new axis basically really. And um, because of the effect, the, the effect of a log transformation is that a unit change along there you know, I'll spare you my grade 11 math teacher's treatment of, of logs and exponents, but basically a unit along that log axis is a percentage difference in the response as opposed to an arithmetic difference in the response. So if you've got salary on the y-axis rather than a unit being 1,000K per year, it's a certain percentage salary. This person makes a certain percentage more than this other person. And that transformation often, um, often helps a lot with greater adherence to assumptions for everything from salary data, actually, to uh, chemical concentrations, to population sizes, things like that. So it's, again, very common in data analysis to uh, log transform data. Importantly, I would add that um, it's not the place to go if you didn't get the results you expected. You know, the, the classic caricature is the supervisor saying, you know, go back and try this on log transform data and hopefully we'll see a significant result. No, that's not, you're not doing it to change the results of the hypothesis test. You're doing it to better adhere to the assumptions so that you can believe the results or have more faith in the results of the hypothesis test. I put the uh, arc sine square root in there, which looks totally weird if you haven't heard of it or used it before. It's very often used with um, data that are uh, proportional, like percentage. And it kind of makes sense, even if we don't bother going through all the gory theory and everything, think about percentage data. Um, log data that that's improved by logging tends to get more variable as the values get bigger right um and that's why having that percentage scale helps because you know 
percentage wise, the difference between 90 and 100 is a lot less than the difference between 10 and 20. You know, um, 10, 20, like 20 is double 10, whereas 100 is just a smidge bigger than 10 or bigger than 90. So that's why a log transformation tends to help because it's squeezing that variability that's increasing as you have bigger values. The thing about percentage data is it tends to be most variable in the middle, you know, between 40, 60%. When you're up around 90% or down around 10%, there tends to be less variability. So, so what's happening when you arc, arc uh, sign square root transform data is that you, uh, you sort of squeeze those middle values and that's again getting your data to better adhere to that uh, the assumptions behind linear models. So before I leave the slide, anybody tell me why I've got log x plus one there rather than log x as a transformation? Uh, it's common to use for like abundance data where you have catches of zero. Yeah, and same thing for um, you know different people have different approaches to non-detects for chemist chemical concentration and stuff but yeah the bottom line is if zeros are possible in your data um, even i remember as badly as i did in grade 12 math that log of zero is not defined so you're basically adding adding one so log of one is going to be zero of course doesn't matter what base you're using but um it's it's allowing for that transformation, even if there's zeros present in the data. There's different approach, log x plus one is probably the most common. Sometimes people do uh, log of the value plus the minimum value observed or something like that. But, but yeah, that's the reason for it. Okay, so I said the second way, but maybe before I go to that, I'll just jump back and just make a statement because I talked about this a little bit before. So so a lot of folks still use or some folks still use um, non-parametric techniques. And those, those are there's really good scripts available in R if um, if non-parametric techniques are, are common in your field in different forms. And uh, the reason I mentioned them here, and we don't we don't do them in the lab. I just I don't there's not a, I don't think there's a useful place for them, but you might, you know, again, I don't want to, uh, I want to prepare you if you, if you have to use them or at least understand their use in your discipline area. So what's going on with virtually all non-parametric techniques that can be applied in all sorts of situations from um, regression correlation, of, you know, two quantitative variables to multi-way ANOVA and, and so on, is that you're transforming the values to ranks. So you're taking the, the you know, those columns that you have of quantitative variables, um, and instead of having a certain number of millimeters or kilograms or concentrations or whatever, you're just giving the biggest one the number one and the smallest one the number 212 or whatever number of observations you have in your data set and analyzing the ranks rather than analyzing the actual values that you measure. And to me, the, the reason not to do that is just too much loss of information. So I'm losing all the information about the concentration of this compound or the size of this population or whatever uh, units my uh, quantitative response and predictor values are measured in. Um, and there's better ways to deal with it. And the main better way, if transformations don't work, is, um, is so-called homemade distributions. So, um, a very common way to do this is you use the actual data, but you make sure the null hypothesis is true. And, and <laughs> the best way for me to 
illustrate that is, you know, I'll, I'll walk you through the homemade null distribution that that uh, you're going to use this the script for, but um, the the general idea is that. You know, and we we do it with a t test, which which I think is the the t test of a difference in in population means of two populations. I think that's the easiest way to con conceptualize it. Where um, imagine you've got two columns in Excel, and uh, the first column is the sex of the fish, and the second column is the fork length in millimeters of the fish. So you got fifty male fish. Each of them has a, a fork length. In millimeters, and then you've got 50 female fish. Each one has a fork length in millimeters, and you want to do a t test to see if the fork length differs between the sexes. And you know, you do your t test the usual way. Um, that's fine. You'll get a p value and so on. With a generating a null distribution, when I say that, so what do you do? Well, you keep the column with the sex of the fish constant, you know, 50 male, 50 female, 50 rows of male fork lengths, 50 rows of female fork lengths. But you take that second column of fork lengths, and here's the thing that kind of blows your mind if you haven't heard about this before. You just randomize, you scramble that row of 100 values. So you're putting fork lengths, you're, you're shuffling them among the 100 fish, without regard to what sex of fish they came from. And think about that for a sec. That's equivalent to the null being true, right? The actual data are what they are. Each male fish has a fork length, each female fish has a fork length. But if you take that list, <laughs> sorry, Zoom just thought I was trying to raise my hand. If you take that list of fork lengths and you just shuffle it, then really you've mixed the fork lengths, you know, between the two sexes. And whatever T value you calculate from that corresponds to a T value where the null hypothesis is true. So I hope everybody kind of gets that and you'll see it more clearly, I think, when we actually run the script in a minute. But so you can do your actual T test and and Many of you know already, you do a t test, you're going to calculate a t value, a test statistic t value that gets bigger, either positively or negatively, if the two populations are more different. You know, the means, the sample means are more different. So the size of that t value reflects how different the sample means are. But if the two populations if the null is true, two populations have the same mean, then the expected value of the t is zero, right? So if we shuffle all the values between the, the male and female fish, what we have generated is a t value that corresponds to that null hypothesis. And we just do that, I don't know, 1,000, 10,000 times, and we create a null hypothesis distribution of t-values, which we can compare your actual t-value to. And we haven't used any assumptions of linear models in carrying out that hypothesis test. And so it, it, it works. I hope it makes sense, especially when you see it happen with the R script. But the R script is just an example, and, the, and you do the same sort of thing. It gets more complicated. But you can do the same sort of thing with, you know, two-way ANOVA or multiple regression or whatever. Okay, so that's it for assumptions. I'll, I'll pause for 30 seconds just to make sure if anybody wants to ask about anything. Um, I just threw the chat room up here and uh, look for any questions. Or if not, then we'll... Soldier ahead at 10 to 3. And yeah, as usual, I'm not being quite as quick as I hope, but I'll try to keep them moving. Okay, going once, going twice, let's go on. And if, yeah, if something comes up, just unmute and yell at me. Okay, so power. I think probably 
most, if not all of you, have heard about power tab, and it might be kind of might be totally clear, which is great. Might still be a little bit murky. So just I'll try to clarify it uh, today a little bit, and then again we'll put it into practice with uh, one of the questions, I guess. Anyway, from lab two. Okay, back to basics. <laughs> so we've seen this uh, kind of paradigm enough that uh, I think you know what's going on here. This is this is really just kind of a pictorial of a one tailed test of a null hypothesis that population one's mean is less than or equal to population two's mean. So everybody knows that if I take a sample, this is the bell curve that you see, the, the symmetric curve that you see is a picture of the null hypothesis distribution. So it's centered at zero. And if I go out and take you know, one sample of individuals from population one and two, and I calculate the difference between them and the appropriate t -st test statistic, and it falls here, where my little arrow is, then I'm going to what the null hypothesis. What am I going to do with the null hypothesis if my if my result in collecting some data is where the arrow is pointing, am I going to reject or accept? Just yell it out, kind of like amen. <laughs> is this thing on? I can't see the chat at this point, so um, I'm not seeing everybody explaining. Oh, there's nothing in the chat. Okay, guys, really? I've collected some data from the two populations. Here's where my test statistic falls. It's pretty close to that vertical dashed line do i reject or not reject not reject not reject okay who said that <laughs> uh, emily Thank you, Emily. What, what's what do you want, Ontario Tech people? Come on, go out on a limb. Take a chance. Yeah, we're in here. The blue line is representing that decision point, right? In here, if I'm using alpha equals 0.05, there's a greater than 5% chance I would have got the data I got if the null was true. So my p-value here would be something greater than alpha. Obviously, and I won't, I won't do the painful other side of this. If I collect the data and I calculate my t test statistic and I'm out here, p will be less than 0.05. I'm on the other side of the decision fence. p is less than 0.05, and I'm going to reject an alpha. Okay, so that, that much is obviously solid, true. Everybody knows that. That's great. What about the situation where the null is not true? That's where we get into this. And I show you the two by two. Remember the Jack Nicholson table? But this is showing it. And it, pardon me for the weird looking um distribution for the alternative hypothesis, but that's just, you know, my my terrible graphics facility. But okay, we've still got the null distribution over here. H subscript O, that the difference in the means is less than or equal to zero. Okay. 
And we've still got that same decision point, which is telling us if the data we collect is out here, we're gonna, that we don't really expect to see that extreme of value if the null is true, so we're gonna reject it. And if the data is over here, well, we don't, it's not that uncommon to see that value if the null is true, so we're gonna accept it or we're not gonna reject it. So that's when we think about beta. Beta is the chance of making a type two error. And a type two error is mistakenly accepting the null hypothesis. So we're in this zone and in this zone, as always, nothing's changed about our decision. If we're in this zone, we're going to accept the null hypothesis. But what, what beta is telling us, well, here we've got a different distribution. Over here, we've still got the null. Over here, we've got an alternative hypothesis distribution. So instead of the difference between the means equaling zero or less than or equal to zero, in this case, we've got the difference between the means is equal to five. So the same amount of variability expected when we take samples, but in this case, the true difference is five. That's an alternative hypothesis distribution. So that's why it's telling us if we use the same decision fence, if the data we collect is somewhere out here, like this, I guess this light blue ball I'm representing a possible result if we go out and sample the two populations, then we're gonna reject the null. And if the null is actually false, if this is the real distribution, then we'd be right, we're cool. But if the data fall over here, and this is the true distribution, we've made a mistake because we're going to accept the null, but the null is false. So you see how the two are kind of other sides of the coin. You can't you can't make both a type one and a type two error. That's for sure, but the possibility is there that if, if the null is true, as we were saying, you have this alpha chance of making a type one error. If the alternative is true on the other side, you have this chance of making a type two error. Type one error, is rejecting the null even though it's true. Type two error is accepting the null even though it's false. Okay. I wanna I want to be absolutely sure that people understand that before I go on. Everybody totally cool with that? Okay. All right, so we've got alpha and beta, but you might be saying to yourself, well, wait a sec, Bob, uh, where, where did the five come from? <laughs> like, what the heck? Like, that just came out of the sky. I can see the less than or equal to zero, you know, defining the null distribution. That kind of made sense. They're different, or all we care about is if the second one's, or the, the first population's bigger than the other, or whatever, but this five just seemed to drop out of the sky. That's exactly right. And that's why people don't spend a lot of time really worried about beta because it's kind of, it's, it's nothing to do with the stats. <laughs> Ironically, given that it's a fairly, I don't know, it's a fairly widely misunderstood concept, but the five is about what deviation from the null do I really want to be able to detect? What's an important deviation from the null? And the, the stats aren't going to tell you that. So we're stuck with this responsibility of defining the alternative hypothesis. In other words, um, let's pretend that 
I'm looking at cadmium in, in filamentous algae and lakes. And I know that cadmium in, in algae is a problem for, in the food web if it gets um, over five, five or over micrograms per gram, it becomes a problem. Under five, yeah, it's there, but it's not really gonna screw things up too much. It, it's really important to me as a algal cadmiumologist to detect if there's, if there's more than five, five or more, micrograms per gram cadmium, I, I got to be able to detect that. And um, in that case, that's defined my value. And what I just described is a t-test against a particular value. And this is a different situation where two, two populations differ, but I think you get the idea. I'm defining as a scientist, what is an important difference for me to detect? The stats aren't telling me that. And that, I mean, you've heard that a million times when, um, why did I just do a thumbs up? Did somebody else do that? It, it probably just saw me doing this and then, yeah, weird. Um, but you've heard a million times, oh, statistical significance doesn't tell you biological significance. And this is kind of what that means. You know, people often mistake that. They they say that, but then they only look at statistically significant results and they ignore non-significant results. So that's why it's really important to understand this concept so that you can not only judge what we call power, but judge studies that have either rejected or accepted the null. Okay, so let's look to understand that you got to get into something called effect size. And effect size is really just what I've just been talking about uh, as a scientist, but really kind of expressing it in the in sort of the statistical terms in the context of this kind of a hypothesis test. So we've got a null hypothesis, and we've got an alternative hypothesis, and we've got the difference between them, the deviation between them, that's kind of what I want to be able to pick up as a difference, and that's called an effect size. So you can see that it's the double-headed blue arrow that sort of measures the difference between the peak of the null and the peak of the alternative. So what effects, I mean, if we take if we take this sort of diagram of the null hypothesis or figure of the null hypothesis, graphic of it, and we translate it into what's really behind the effect size. Obviously, the effect size is, you know, if it detecting one, a different, <laughs> I raised my hand, if detecting a difference of one microgram per gram, you know, that uh, I guess the population one might be the, the cadmium in, in filamentous algae in Lake Skugog, and population two is the cadmium in, in uh, filamentous algae in Canal Lake. So if I, if I say, well, the difference between Skugog and Canal is less than five, that's not really important in terms of the food. If it's greater than five, that's important. So if you think about that, effect size, if, if somebody said to me, if I asked Andrea Kirkwood, my colleague, I said, well, what, what difference between the legs do you want to be able to detect? Andrea said, well, I want to be able to detect like one microgram per gram. That's a smaller effect size. And how's that going to affect my error probabilities? If the, if the distributions within each lake were, as you see in this graphic, and I and Andrew says to me, I, you know, I got to detect like a difference of one, not a difference of five, but one. What's going to happen to my error probabilities then? Just imagine sliding those. I'll, I'll try to do it. <laughs> this, is, this will be like a train wreck, but no, I won't even try to do it. I'll wreck my uh, 
So sliding those together using the alpha 0.05, because that's the standard of our industry, right? What's that going to do to beta? Somebody just help me. Like, imagine taking that alternative hypothesis distribution and sliding it to the left, closer and closer to the null. What's going to happen to beta, given that it's the probability under that telling? Beta is going to get bigger. Thank you, Flavio. Yes. And it makes sense. Luckily, most of stats make sense because. If Andrea wants to detect that, just the one microgram per gram difference, it's going to be bloody hard to do that with the amount of variability we got here. Um, you know, we got to we got to really. It's going to take like four hundred samples from each leg to detect that small of a difference if it's there. Remember, remember, beta is what's your chance of mistakenly accepting the null? If the alternative is true, so if the alternative is true, if there's a true difference of one, then my chance of mistakenly accepting the null that there's no difference is going to get really high the tighter I make that. So you can see, I hope you see the trade off there. So if you express that in a formula, that's where when people use um, power a consideration of power to help design the study. There's the formula for effect size. The T alpha and T beta are just sort of where that decision point is. You know, ba based on the alpha and beta error probabilities that you want to have. The one thing that we can control in this, we don't really have any control over how much variability there is. You know, if you think about the fill, Filamentous algae in the two lakes, it's going to vary for a variety of reasons, plant to plant, or they're not plants, but you know what I mean, stock to stock. So the real thing that we have control on, you know, for planning the study is N, right? And again, we won't, I won't bore you going to all the machinations of the formula, but basically, you know, Andrea comes to me and says, well, I want this, I want, this is an important effect size. What sample size do I need, Bob? And I would say to her, well, um, what do you want alpha to be? What do you want beta to be? What's your notion of variability? You've done some preliminary sampling, and therefore here's the sample size you need. And she says, well, you know, we don't have the money to collect that or analyze it or anything. I said, well, um, with the sample size you got, and using alpha 0.05, here's the power that you have to detect that smaller difference between. So you can you can manipulate that formula in different ways, and you'll see it in, in one of the scripts that we use in the lab. But the bottom line in it is, is fully recognizing when you're in that hypothesis testing scenario that you're looking at error probabilities you know, the type one error probability, type two error probability, and and effect size. And those are important determinations of you know and of what sample size you need if you have a given alpha that you wanna uh, and, and or beta that you want to use. And what what your beta was if you had a certain effect size or a certain um, sample size, effect size, and alpha. So that any one of those things you can determine if you know the uh, the other two, and that's what the the script that we're going to use in the lab is based on. I'm just going to put the power into my one device here. One sec. Okay, so I've kind of skated over a lot of stuff relatively rapidly, but I want to get to the actual um, use of the scripts and, and you just see the thing in in real time. But in terms of power, these are the three overriding, super important questions to ask yourself 
and not just to get through lab two, but in the research that you're doing. The fir first and foremost, what deviation from the null hypothesis, whatever the context, it doesn't have to be a simple t-test context, could be a two-way ANOVA. And that, it gets bloody hard, by the way. Uh, it gets bloody hard to specify, yes, um, you know, Flavia is doing her, her study of the different techniques of, of uh, reducing macrophage populations around docks and the effects of them on different aspects of the ecosystem. What deviation from the null of no effect of the, of the uh, weed management technique, do I want to be able to detect? Oh, I don't know. I just want to see what's there. And sorry, Flavia, I'm not making fun of you, but it's, a, it's true of any researcher. Actually nailing them down to what's important as a deviation from the null is super difficult. I thought the stats would do that. <laughs> and really it comes back, it's kind of like the conceptual model thing. The stats aren't telling you what an important deviation is, just like they weren't telling you what your concept of this affecting that, which in turn affects that other aspect of the system I'm, I'm studying. The second uh, thing to that you really have to ponder, and we don't nearly enough, is what's the relative importance of type one and two errors? And um, most of us walk around in this alpha equals 0.05 days and beta just does what it does. And we might hand wave, and I'm literally waving my hand as I say this, about uh, the chance of type two errors in different situations. But when you think about it, think about it in, uh, oh, I don't know, the, the, you know, I've told you before, I work on bioassessment research and the classic decision in a bioassessment context, you know, you go, I go to a river or a stream or a lake or whatever, collect some biota. And beyond all the complexity of the situation, the basic question is, um, is this ecosystem, has it been degraded by human activity here? And so think of two things. One, First of all, what's the null hypothesis there? Well, the null hypothesis is that it hasn't, you know, this golf course, this mine, whatever, has not caused a change in the in the ecosystem in this stream. So if I reject the null, even though it's true, I created, I've done a type one error, and I will raise an alarm. Okay. The, the golf course has had an effect. And you have to think through, again, it's not, not a statistical point, but you have to think through what are the consequences of mistakenly rejecting an null hypothesis? Um, in my case, oh, probably gonna have some more sampling done there and take a, take a closer look at the stream and you know, see if there's some, if there's a problem with that irrigation system or, or uh, fertilizing or whatever. That's the consequences of a type two error, doing all that, raising the alarm when there was no need to. So type one error. Type two error, let's say I sample the stream and uh, test the hypothesis, don't reject it, accept it. No, nothing to see here, it's all okay. And I've made a type two error. So actually, the stream has been affected by human activity, but I've mistakenly concluded that it hasn't. There's consequences to that. So, and I would argue in my, my field, um, and probably some others, that there's greater consequences to a type two error than a type one error. So that's, that's mine. And I guess for those that work on some of you, a few of you maybe, uh, work on, you know, less applied work. You know, I've done, I've done some studies, I don't know, um, freshwater mussel shell morphology. Nobody cares what the result is. <laughs> There's, you know, equal consequences of a type one error and a type two error. You know, I've, I've been misled. It turns out that shell morphology is not 
related to the environment of the shell, the substrate environment of the shell. Um, but I concluded, I rejected the null and, and concluded it was related. Or shell morphology is related to the substrate that the muscle is living in. And I accepted the null that it wasn't. So I did a type 2 error. In that case, I would conclude that they're about the same importance. Alpha should equal beta. But that the notion, kind of like number one, is that that's something for me to work through in my discipline. It's not something that the stats are going to tell me and the frustration I have that I'm sure you'll have after today <laughs> is that we obsess about type one error. We obsess about, you know, you've got to test those null hypotheses with alpha equal 0.05. We, if we do anything about type two error, we just sort of go, yeah, you know, I'm worried. My type two error probability was probably really high here. Jeez, okay, on we go. Um, but we don't really think about it too hard. And in particular, we don't think enough maybe not at all, about the relative importance of those two kinds of errors. What are the consequences of making a type one error? You know, writ large. And what are the consequences of making a type two error? Because as you'll see, when we look at the script where we do a little power analysis, um, that, that has a big effect on wh what you would use in a perfect world. If you, you know, I might conclude, okay, in this study, I'm going to use alpha equals beta equals 0.2. And uh, good luck getting it published <laughs> because uh, the world's quite not there yet. But, and I'm not, you know, I don't want you to become a revolutionary in your discipline. For me, it's more important to get that understanding so you know what's underneath the hood when you're, when you're reporting on the, results of hypothesis tests. Finally, um, on, on power, uh, do we have some kind of control over N? So, you know, if you, if you are doing a lab or observational study, um, experimental or observational study, uh, such that you can set it up, you know what's important, or you figured out what an important deviation is. There's my thumbs up on the screen again. Um, and, you know the relative values of alpha and beta. So can you jack up sample size to an extent that you are able to use particular values of alpha and beta given your scientific decisions about what's an important deviation and what's the relative importance of them? There are situations, and again, we'll probably encounter one or maybe two when you do your paper reviews where tests are overpowered. And Probably everybody's read the paper, a paper, published paper, where, um, and I've published a couple, <laughs> where, where uh, and it happens a lot with um, correlation studies, you know, big data set, and uh, there's 612 uh, observations and highly significant correlation between this dimension and that dimension, or this this chemical concentration and that population size or whatever. And in that case, it, it can be equally fraught because, um, and not for the reason that you think, you know, people always say, oh, well, if you look at enough correlations, some will be significant just by chance. No, not that. It's um, with, a, with a sample size that big, um, correlations will be, you know, deviations from zero will be detected um, that are quite tiny, you know, so you, you see a correlation of uh, 0.13 or something like that, that's equivalent to uh, R squared of, uh, I don't know, point, really small, <laughs> anyway, um, and you write a paper about it, when really that if that true correlation existed in the in the system that you're looking at, wouldn't be that important. So again, it's the other side of that significance, not 
statistical significance not equal in importance. Okay, so uh, I'll give you five minutes to di digest all that, 3.20, and then we'll come back for uh, 25 minutes of um, playing with the R scripts in lab two. <laughs> 